Uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. What a gorgeous day. I thought I'd open this morning with some weather talk. <laughs> you always enjoy that, don't you? What a beautiful day. We have beautiful autumns in Dallas. People are always complaining about our weather. We have too long a summer, too short a winter, but beautiful falls and, and springs. So you don't have to put that in your notes. But <laughs> Well, you remember in our last, last lesson, we did a bit of gerrymandering and skipped over a portion of this sixth chapter in order to give it its own standing for our attention today. And that was the portion found in verses 9 through 15 containing the material out of the Sermon on the Mount that has come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. In context, Jesus has been teaching about the importance of the Christian living life in the presence of God, in, in contrast to living it before men. And he made application, remember, in three different areas of Christian practice, almsgiving or giving to the poor, praying, and fasting. And it was in the midst of his focus on prayer that the Lord gave his disciples something like an excursus on what prayer ought to be as opposed to the type of prayer that he had been speaking against. He had contrasted what we might call authentic prayer with what was commonly observed among the Pharisees who prayed ostentatiously in order to be seen by men, and also the Gentiles who thought by the multiplicity of words they would be heard by God. And Jesus concluded, in the 8th verse of Matthew chapter 6, don't be like them. Don't be like them. That's one of the themes of the sermon as a whole. Don't be like them. In chapter 5, verse 20, he said much the same thing. Look, your righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, otherwise you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't be like them. And then, when he came to the subject of prayer, he expanded on what true prayer ought to look like. In Luke's account of the Lord's Prayer, the disciples actually ask him to teach them how to pray. So we can imagine that this teaching probably took place more than once in different circumstances in different places. Prayer is too important too fundamental to engage in it with less than the proper attitude or the proper understanding of what it is you're actually doing when you say you are praying. It's been called the highest activity of the human soul. For true prayer brings the child of God face to face with the one who is both our loving Heavenly Father and our holy, righteous God. True prayer is entered into not as a showcase for the prayer, uh, neither as an exercise in desperate persuasion. No, Jesus says, God is not like that. He is our Father, and He knows our needs before we ask Him. He is not ignorant of our plight, nor does He need persuading by us. Prayer is more for us. Calvin wrote about this in his Institutes. Uh, it grants to us that we might enter into communion with him, as the author of Hebrews puts it, to enter into the holy place and become an intimate with him as we acknowledge his many attributes. It arouses in us a delight in him as we express our dependence upon him. And that's why Jesus, if you think about it, in his earthly experience, you know, he grew and he grew to desire so greatly his father in prayer. And his disciples had seen that in him. And so it was natural for them to ask, as Luke recorded in the parallel passage, Lord, teach us to pray. That's what they said. Lord, teach us to pray. 
And his answer was structured not as a transcript to repeat a, a new kind of liturgical device to utilize moving forward, but as a model to follow. Pray then in this way, he said. Pray like this. He gave them a pattern. That doesn't mean it's wrong necessarily to recite the Lord's Prayer in unison together as uh, we perhaps do on occasion. But I was thinking about it. I can't remember the last time that we did do that uh, here. But other churches do it often, sometimes uh, every uh, Sunday. Uh, and it's only that the Lord did not give it to us for that purpose. Rather, His purpose was to reveal the glory of the object of our prayer, the priorities which should color every word of our prayers, and the parameters of our personal petitions, which are moment by moment dependence upon Him. Prayer ought to be more than an academic exercise or worse, a mindless ritual. The Lord has given to us the gift of prayer so that we might commune and have fellowship with Him. So we left the sermon last week and skipped over these verses. Let's read them now. Let's really begin with verse 8. Jesus said, So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That could also be translated the evil one. They're equivalent, really, because all evil is sourced not ultimately, but finds its perfect expression in the evil one. Uh, deliver us from evil, and then the part in brackets in most of your Bibles, I think, but not all. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Most of the oldest manuscripts don't carry that, but very early on they did, and it's a wonderful truth. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. I'm not going to say a lot about those last two verses except in conjunction with verse 12. So, well, you see there are six petitions in all in the prayer, and they're divided logically into two parts. The first three are directed toward the glory of God and the desire that it be magnified on the earth, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. The next three concern the petitions we are to make in regard to our own needs. Give us, forgive us, deliver us. But he begins with how we are to address God in prayer, and that is our Father who is in heaven. Now, we today are so familiar with the Lord's Prayer that these words really roll off our tongue. Our Father, which art in heaven. Uh, that it's, we don't even think about it sometimes. Uh, but in the ears of the disciples on this day, Christ's instruction would have bordered on the shocking. For it was not at all a common thing to address God as one's Father. In the Judaism of the time, and really rightly in part, God was only referred to in the highest of terms. He was the most high, almighty God, sovereign Lord, king of the universe. But Jesus called him my father. Even the more surprising Aramaic Abba, Abba, which you know had a meaning something like daddy, perhaps not exactly like that, but definitely portraying a tender familiarity that first century Jews simply were not accustomed to when used of God. Well, of course, Jesus was ultimately God's son and God his father, 
But here in our prayer, Jesus is teaching his disciples, he's teaching you and me to make a similar claim. Pray then in this way, my Father, our Father. And this would not uh, have been the last time throughout his ministry with them. He would emphasize time and again that in becoming his disciple, they would show themselves to have been born of God, to have become children of God. Think back after Jesus had died and then he'd been raised again. He told Mary to go to my brothers and say to them, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And later the apostles would come to understand this profound thought that God had sent the very spirit of Jesus into their hearts, crying, Abba, Father. This imagery is so powerful. It may break down somewhat in our own lives when fathers so often uh, fail to be all that they should be. Uh, but uh, the reality is God never fails. What Jesus was teaching the disciples at the very least and is still teaching us today is that Almighty God is personal. He is loving. He has pursued us individually and made us his own. We belong to him and he loves us. At the same time, he is our father in heaven. And that's a necessary addition and a reminder that God rules. He is on his throne and is sovereign and powerful. Our loving father is also the omnipotent one, the almighty. So if we value Jesus' instruction to us on prayer, we learn at the very beginning that his concern is not just with protocol, addressing God in a kind of correct way, but in our very approach to him, acknowledging in our hearts his majesty and the wonder of his grace and love toward us. And that's a reason that I... I personally think it's a wise thing to make it a habit when we set aside time to pray, to not simply launch into our prayer with uh, no thought, but to, in a sense, prepare our hearts to approach the throne of grace by pondering uh, the great truths that we know about him. And of course, a good way to do it is to read our Bibles. Uh, for they contain uh, the wonders of the glory of our great God, our, our Father. And we find in them daily reminders of who our Lord is and all His glory and what He's done for us. Don Carson made the helpful suggestion that we should come to God in prayer in the spirit of the hymn writer. Immortal. Invisible God, only wise and light and accessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise, great Father of glory, pure Father of light. Thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All laud we would render, O oh, help us to see, tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. So coming to him then in that frame of mind, we'll be better positioned to pray in the kind of order that Jesus proposes here with our hearts first focused on the preeminence of the one to whom we are praying and then able to submit to him our own personal needs. And so the first of the six petitions establishes the priority in verse 9, hallowed be your name. Now, I've just spent a bit of time discussing how we are to address God in prayer, which is to say, in a sense, by what name we are to call him. And Father is certainly one of several names by which God is revealed to us in the scriptures. But here his name stands for much more than a moniker by which a person 
is identified. I think you're aware that in these ancient times, the name meant far more uh, to people than it does to us today. It stood for the person as a whole. It really defined or, or pointed to the character of the person. So that is what is at stake here with God's name. It is his reputation. And the prayer is that it will be hallowed. That's not a word we often use except when we say the Lord's Prayer. But it comes from the same Greek word that we translate as, as holy. The, the petition then is that God would so act as to ensure that by reputation he would be considered holy. The prophets of the Old Testament uh, spoke to this concern uh, often about the name of God. I'll give you one example in Ezekiel 36. Uh, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel condemning Israel for her conduct in the nations among which he had scattered them in judgment. And he said in verse 20 of Ezekiel 36, when they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of his land. But I had, this is God speaking, but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. So Israel had not hallowed God's name. You can see then, the interesting thing here is that when we pray, hallowed be your name, we know intuitively that we are praying, what we are praying for is for ourselves, that we ourselves and really all of creation would ourselves regard him as holy and revere him as we ought to revere him. While it appears to be a prayer that God would hallow his own name, hallowed be your name, in reality it's a humble plea that he would make us holy to the degree that we would enhance his reputation but by all that we do and all that we say. It is the first petition, I say, and it immediately establishes the priority that first and foremost, our desire is that all honor is to be given to him whose name is the highest name. What is the chief end of man? That's how the catechism begins. So, well, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God is to hallow his name. The second petition in verse 10 is your kingdom come. I'm not sure we can plumb the depths of what that means and still study the entire prayer this morning because the idea of God's kingdom permeates the Bible and is something that pertains to but also transcends time. What I mean is that God's rule, which is essentially what his kingdom is, is a rule that has existed and is existing and will exist in the future, both materially and spiritually, though it may not appear so at times, God is always ruling. His kingdom always stands and he has never not been king of creation and king of the ages. But the Lord instructs us in this prayer to ask that his kingdom might come. So it's highly likely that his intent was that his disciples, while you know, daily living kingdom lives and while always seeking the advancement of his kingdom, uh, in the world around them, that they would nevertheless continually express their hope and desire in prayer that Christ's promised messianic kingdom would be consummated. The, the promise of the Old Testament repeated over and over. And the New Testament bears testimony that they heard and understood because the apostles never lost sight of Jesus' promise to come a second time 
to earth and establish his earthly millennial kingdom, this time without sin, without misery. And while unable to predict with any kind of certainty the precise time of his second coming, still they beckon their readers to eagerly look for the blessed hope. The Apostle Paul is a good example. He devoted a good portion of his epistles uh, to this topic, and he ended, remember, his epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. He ended it in chapter 16, verse 22, with that very commonly desired, the, the very common designation, expression of desire at the time, Maranatha, O Lord, come. O oh Lord, come. And how did John close the book of Revelation? Come, Lord Jesus. That was John's closing sentiment. Is it yours? Is that your sentiment? In our daily prayers, uh, do we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come? I must confess, it doesn't have as big a place in my prayers as it ought to. I get so caught up in the, in the here and now and what I'm concerned about and what happened and my hopes and, and my petitions. But the thought should captivate us. What a day that will be when he comes again to this sordid world how we complain about the world. <laughs> Has it ever been this bad? Well, one day Christ is going to come again and he'll make all things new in, as he ushers in his perfect kingdom. The third petition is also found in verse 10. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's possible that this part of the prayer is simply a logical extension of the previous. When God's uh, kingdom comes to this earth, then it follows that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But it's more likely the Lord intended this to be its own specific desire of his followers, that they should hope and pray that the kind of righteousness that shines so bright in heaven would also shine here on earth where we live and breathe. We speak of the will of God, you know, in different ways. It's one of those words that's kind of tricky. You, you got to pay attention when you're talking about the will of God. There is his decretive will by which he ordains all that comes to pass. In that sense, his will is always accomplished on earth, no matter how ugly and sinful it may appear, because he is the one who has decreed it. But we may also identify the preceptive will of God, which is, I'm, I'm going to quote from one of my favorite theologians, which is Burkhoff, which is the rule of God laid down by God for his moral creatures, indicating the duties he enjoins upon them. This is the will of God, which is widely and often disobeyed and transgressed, even by those who belong to him. And yet, God would have us be, Jesus would have us be dutiful in prayer that that preceptive will of God would even now be mirrored on this earth, even as it is perfectly carried out in the heavenlies. You might say, well, that's a wasted prayer. That's never going to happen. I, it, I, it can't even happen in my life. Um, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But shouldn't it still be our desire? However we take it, this petition uh, brings with it solemn responsibilities for the believer. For one thing, we ought to take great pains in actually knowing God's preceptive will, what it is. Fortunately, the Lord has not kept it a secret from us, but has manifestly revealed this will to us in his word. So we must search and study God's word in order that we may knowing it. And in knowing it, 
come to perceive His will for us. If we do not do that, search the Scriptures, find His will for us, conform ourselves to it. If we do not do that, as Paul warned the church in Rome, we'll instead of being conformed to this world, not renewed by the transforming of, or not transformed by the renewing of our minds and not coming to prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For that is our responsibility, too, to not just know his will, but to do it. That is the hard thing, is it not? It was hard for the Son of God himself. Did you know that? Think about that, to do God's will. Despite what we say when we put our systematic theology hat on, and we pronounce that unlike us mere mortals who are, quote, not able not to sin, Jesus was, quote, not able to sin. That's a topic for another time. But still, he was tempted far beyond what any man or woman has ever been tempted to disobey God's will and and choose another path. We're witnesses to that. When we come uh, in reverence that evening to that garden in Gethsemane, and we see the cost of Jesus praying that prayer when he knelt down to pray and he suffered in prayer, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, and yet not my will, but yours be done. There's the cost of obeying that prayer. In heaven, where the Son now sits triumphantly at the right hand of the Father, God's will is being perfectly accomplished. For there is nothing in heaven that will hinder it. This prayer is that the same will be the case on earth. Well, up to this point, obviously, the concern in the Lord's model prayer has been an ardent desire for God's glory, a concern for his reputation, his rule, and his will. But beginning in verse 11, uh, the emphasis shifts to a disciple's humble dependence upon his grace. It shifts from your to our And again, this is a model prayer, and so it's important to note the Lord's priorities for us. First is that we serve Him, but that does not mean we may not confidently confidently bring before Him our personal needs. And what could be more basic need than our daily bread? Jesus didn't just mean bread, of course, The early church fathers were so surprised at this sudden shift from lofty ideas of God to the mundane subject of bread that they imagined his mention of bread must have some deeper meaning, must be connected to a communion, or or must be picturing bread as as the word of God. But that was a passing fancy, and commentators have generally agreed that the bread... Jesus instructed his followers to pray for was symbolic of all of our material needs. He did not suggest that we pray for wealth. I had a friend in high school who told me one time, as I recall the conversation, that he did pray for wealth, uh, thinking if God gave him wealth, that would give him something to be humble about. Clever, clever. (laughs) But nowhere in Scripture are we encouraged to pray for wealth. Jesus instead commands that we ask God for our daily bread. That word daily is a quite rare Greek word found only here and and perhaps in one other known document. In Jesus' day, people tended to live uh, from hand to mouth. Uh, depending upon the day's wages in order to meet the needs of the day. 
And so this word daily means something like, you know, what is the situation at the moment? That's my translation of it. What is the situation at the moment? So if the prayer was prayed in the morning, it would be intended as a plea for the day ahead. If it was prayed in the evening, it would be for the next day, for tomorrow's bread. We often hear people say, I've certainly said it, I sure am glad I didn't live in the Middle Ages or in some other ancient uh, time. What we mean is that times were much more difficult uh, then than they are today when the reality is the poorest in our society would be considered wealthy by those living in earlier times. I don't mean that, I mean that to be a blanket statement, not true in every uh, detail. So we should be thankful for that, uh, that we, that God has put us in a, in a place, in a world in which our material needs are, are relatively well provided. But the lesson is the same. No matter the generation who heard the Lord's teaching, we are totally dependent upon God for our sustenance. We should acknowledge that and daily remind ourselves of it by petitioning our loving Father to give us this day our daily bread. The Lord doesn't promise us wealth. He doesn't even promise us our daily bread, but he does promise us peace and encourages us toward daily, even moment by moment, dependence upon him. Well, next, the Lord instructs us to pray in verse 12, forgive us our debts <clears throat> as we have also forgiven our debtors. You know, those times when we find ourselves in situations when, where we're expected to recite the Lord's Prayer in unison with others, you know, perhaps visiting, visiting another church uh, or going to a wedding or some other ceremony, the bulletin or the liturgy or the like will inform you not of the words of the Lord's Prayer because we all know the Lord's Prayer by, by memory, but of the one little word in it. Is it going to be debts and debtors, or is it going to be trespasses and trespass? The distinction has arisen, the reason you open up your wedding thing and it says the Lord's Prayer, debts or trespasses, uh, the, 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 this distinction has arisen in part because in the parallel passage in Luke, Luke records the prayer as a request to forgive our sins or our trespasses, hamartias, but the common word for sin, missing the mark. And also because, as in our own passage here in verses 14 and 15, the Lord went on to speak of forgiveness in terms of transgressions, which is a word related to, to sins. But if you think about it, there really is no difference for sin or a trespass or a transgression creates a debt, a debt to God, especially for we owe to God our full obedience, our full obedience to his revealed will for us. Or in the case of interpersonal relationships, a debt to a person that you have offended in some way. So first bread, then forgiveness. We need forgiveness as much as we need bread. And I don't have time to cite all the psychologists who have said that's the biggest problem with the people that they meet with. They need forgiveness or they need to forgive. But I want to note two quick things about this petition. The first is that this is not a tit-for-tat situation. The Lord is not saying that God's forgiveness is in any way dependent upon whether or not the sinner has forgiven other people who have sinned against or offended him. God forgives the repentant, and repentance is a gift. And so how does one know if a sinner has been repentant and God has forgiven him? He becomes a different person. That's how we know. 
If he lives a life characterized by an unforgiving spirit himself, then he bears witness that he is not one whom God has forgiven. That's the whole point, you know, of that parable that Jesus gave later in Matthew chapter 18 of the man whom the king had forgiven uh, much, but who then went out and he refused to forgive one who owed much less than the amount that he had been forgiven. And the king called him back in and he called him, you wicked servant, should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you. So this man had revealed who he truly was by his own behavior. The second thing uh, to be said is that the forgiveness spoken of here is not the same judicial forgiveness that comes to us when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That forgiveness occurs one time. It's the forgiveness that enabled the Apostle Paul to state his confidence that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. It's the same forgiveness that is the mark of the new covenant, assuring us that God will remember our sins no more. The same forgiveness that led the psalmist to say in Psalm 103, verse 12, that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now, this forgiveness is the kind that some refer to as a paternal forgiveness that exists within the family. When a person becomes a Christian, we all know this, uh, he or she is not yet done with sin. Uh, we have a sin nature that continues to entice us and lead us into sin. And when that happens, we are to be the confessors that the Apostle John wrote about in 1 John chapter 1, specifically verse 9. We confess our sins and we confess that we are sinners and God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He restores the fellowship of the confessing sinner with himself like a father with his own child. He is quick to forgive when the child asks for it. It's a paternal forgiveness. And you know, you just don't have time to go into everything in great detail. If you want to pursue that further, uh, look up Dr. Johnson's uh, lesson on that verse uh, out of his series in Matthew. He goes into it in quite a bit of detail. So does uh, Dr. Boyce in his commentary. <laughs> and then finally, in verse 13, there is the sixth petition. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Well, God, of course, will never tempt us to sin. James 1, 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But it is confusing, let's admit, the way the sentence reads. Professor Carson clarifies the confusion a bit by identifying this as a Lightities, lightities. <laughs> I had to look up the pronunciation. It's a figure of speech, L-I-T-O-T-E-S. It's a lightities. It's this figure of speech which expresses something by negating the contrary. In this case, into temptation is negated. And so we're to understand the prayer as lead us not into temptation, but away from it. That's what our prayer is. Not that he would lead us into temptation, but it's a way, it's a figure, a, a figurative way of saying, no, but that's not where we want to go. We want to go this other way. It's a, re, it's a prayer that reflects a desire. I almost certainly know has come from your heart. Lord, keep me from, from sin. Help me to avoid the dangers of sin. Just as we look to God for our physical provision, we're also to look to him for moral triumph and for spiritual victory. Well, this is the Lord's uh, model prayer for us. It is designed to keep us from the hypocritical and the mindless prayer. 
And it illustrates that though we have every right and our Lord's own encouragement to take our personal needs to the Lord in prayer, we are to be heavenly minded. Those first three petitions remind us that when we pray, this is what should be the animating urgency that pulsates in our hearts that God's name would be hallowed uh, both in our own lives and in the world, that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done. And only then will we truly be in the right frame of mind to bring before the throne of grace the not trivial needs and concerns that directly affect us and those we know about and love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this model prayer. It's uh, such an encouragement. It is a great uh, lesson for us. It's one thing to study it, ponder, attempt to understand what our Lord Jesus was truly teaching us. It's another thing to take that and adopt it and adapt it to our own prayers. And as the prayer indicates, we are totally dependent upon your grace for that. So we pray for that. How we rejoice that we can call you Father. And how we do, Lord, want from the deepest of our hearts to be able to say, your will be done, uh, your kingdom come. We pray for that, Lord. Um, we just focused on it. So now we're praying and we say it, Lord, your kingdom come. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.